Kia Koto, Marky here with a video for you as a response video to a channel called True Crime Rocket Science. Uh, this is a video that I found on my feed this morning. I'm not sure when exactly it was released. But before we get into that, uh, first of all, a thank you to the people who responded to my last video with suggestions, uh, nice polite suggestions as well, uh, about my dilemma of uh, having owning an artifact that actually was gifted by uh, Vladimir Putin, um, Vlad the Invader, as I call him, and uh, what to do with it, the ethical dilemma around that. Uh, so thank you very much for all the suggestions and kind comments and thoughts. Uh, so and another preamble before we get into the meat of the video is this is a channel which is all about helping people with a lesser known condition called retroactive jealousy, uh, which affects pretty millions of people worldwide, but it's not yet officially recognised by the medical and psychiatric establishment. And people that have it generally suffer in silence, thinking they're the only ones with this. They don't realise it's a thing. So one of the big goals, the, the big goal of this channel is to get information out there to people that, uh, that can be helped. Uh, first of all, by knowing it's a condition, and then secondly, by uh, getting some guidance on how to begin recovery. So, although a lot of our content is about other things, and there's reasons for that, which I won't go into here, I've gone into those in other videos, uh, we, we cover a very wide, great, wide range of things. We don't normally stray into true crime, but I have done videos on Chris Watts, and I've done a little bit on Rex Herman. And uh, also check out those other videos where I talk a little bit about uh, my... Uh, slight discomfort with the whole topic of true crime and um, my kind of um, slight reluctance to cover it uh, on this channel. We, we, I do get tempted to step into it occasionally, such as such as I will today. Okay, so uh, so thank you for joining us. Bear in mind also that this is a neurodivergent channel and the style is not slick. It's filmed on an iPhone and I'm actually pointing the iPhone at my computer screen. So you may get that horrible jazzing effect. Apologies for that. And maybe shaky camera from time to time. And that is part of the charm of this channel. If you like slick, well presented, well produced channels, this is not the one for you. Although my co-host does actually, she produces, Gwendolyn produces, um, she edits and uh, and produces nice, nice quality videos. I don't because I film in the passion of the moment. And if I had to get everything right and perfect uh, and set everything up before making a video, I would probably never make a video. So there we go. On with the show, as they say. Uh, I don't really call it a show, but there we go. Um, so uh, True Crime Rocket Science is one of my favourite channels on YouTube. Um, so uh, I follow a lot of true crime, but my interest, I said I wouldn't get into the, the whys, but just briefly, my interest mainly is in deception detection uh, and part of my professional work is in the forensic field not all of it but a chunk of it is in the forensic field so i am very interested in uh crime detection but particularly the psychological aspect of crime detention uh crime detection <laughs> uh crime detection hopefully leads to crime detention uh so i follow a lot of channels I've, and in the recent video that i did on chris watts i listed the, ch the channels that i follow and that i recommended to other people uh, there are about four or five and this was one of them okay so uh, true crime rocket science the most authentic voice in true crime so there's a guy called nick uh he's south african i'm not sure if he lives in south africa he travels a lot he's a writer uh he's written uh many books i'm not sure exactly how many but he's written on uh the madeline mccann case and other cases and he travels extensively and does does field work and sometimes shoots videos from uh, certain locations and he is responding in this video to a recent school shooting but he's making a general point that's why rex herman uh the month look at the state of him um is coming up on the screen and he compares so he's drawing a wide that's brian Kohnberg. Uh, accused of the Idaho murders. Chris Watts, I've done a couple of videos on him. Uh, he's a piece of work. Um, so he's, he's focusing on this recent school shooting, but making a more general point. And he's talking about two things in this video, uh, sadism and uh, anality, um, that I actually want to take issue with. Okay, so I'm disagreeing with this channel, but not from... Uh, 
unlike most people on YouTube who seem unable to disagree about things without being abusive, uh, I have huge respect for this channel, huge respect for, for Nick. I think this is the first time he's ever said anything that I've disagreed with, and I just want to uh, share why uh, from, from my perspective as a psychotherapist. Uh, Rex Herman again. Look at that hair. He should have been put in jail just for that hair. Uh, never mind the murders. Um, so he's bringing lots of different people into this and making quite a broad statement. And he's given a, a kind of a theory, uh, which first of all, he seems to apply to school shootings and then to um, a range of different situations that are, that are quite different. Um, so Rex Herman, a uh, serial killer, and Chris Watts, uh, Family Annihilator. Um, so very different, very different from the school shootings. And, he, and later on, he brings in a few other people as well. Talks a lot about bullying, which is great because um, bullying is such a terrible thing um, and causes so much harm, um, not just to the pe person being bullied, but uh, vicariously sometimes when somebody that's bullied acts out in a in a certain way so i'm going to talk a little bit about school shootings but um mainly i'm going to be reacting to um nick's uh overarching theory that he's presenting in this in this video which i really struggle with i don't really i don't really get okay but this is from a, a point of view of a, a a respectful disagreement uh i'm not dissing him or his channel in fact i recommend his channel um he comes across as a really nice guy as well um and uh, I love his humour. Um, you just saw a clip from the Lord of the Rings there. He interjects his videos with little clips um, from movies and things like that, just to just to make them more interesting. And um, again, that that injection of humour. So, as with you know, with any school shooting or any um, murder or you know any, especially a big event, um, you know, first of all, respect. Um, you know, I want to pay my respects to uh, the victims and the victims' family uh, and the perpetrators' family as well, because they're all victims. They're all victims. They're, they're, there's, there are only victims, really, in a school shooting. And I'm not going to be commenting about this particular school shooting case because I haven't looked into it. Um, I've, I've seen headlines about it, but I've not ever watched a video on it or um, read anything. So, uh, so although a lot of a lot of images from from that uh, incident, uh, that tragedy, are coming up on the screen, that's not going to be my focus. It's going to I'm going to be addressing the uh, the overall theory that Nick's presenting, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, school shootings as well, because Nick talks about how I think he said the FBI and oh, no, the Secret Services. He said. Um, it always makes me laugh that the Americans sort of have a, a secret service that's called the secret service. It's kind of, <laughs> I suppose it's, it's honest, isn't it? But it's not, not very secret. Um, he's talking about the secret service that's saying that they don't have such a thing as a profile for a school, a mass school shooter. Um, and I think I know why. Um, so we'll, we'll get on to that a little bit later. So he's, he's talking, he's quoting and drawing on lots of different sources here, Pulp Fiction, all kinds of things. So essentially Nick's theory that he's purporting here is that uh, sadism and something that he calls anality or uh, being anal are uh, two of the main factors uh, in serious crime. Um, and he's citing the school killings and he's citing uh, Brian Kohnberger, Rex Herman, Chris Watts, etc. Okay, now I don't know why he's showing Egyptian stuff there, but it would have made sense at the time. So, uh, and I hope I don't, I hope, um, because I'm showing, I'm showing this as background really, just something so you can see. And also it prompts my thinking as well while we go through things. And I'd like you to check out this channel and give it some love because it's a great channel. Um, just because I disagree with what he says in this one video doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, I won't be continuing to follow his channel and continue to enjoy it. So first of all, let's talk about the sadism. So he's saying that sadism is is at the root of, of all these crimes. Now, I would disagree with that, but this could be semantics in a way because people use words in different ways. So I tend to use words in very clinical ways and in, in the, you know, the way that they're uh, referred to in, in the field of psychology. Um, so when it comes to sadism uh, and crime, um, there, the general consensus is that there are two kinds of sadism. There is a general sadism and there is a sexual sadism. 
and the two are going to overlap an awful lot really but a sexual sadist is somebody that gets turned on by inflicting pain distress or humiliation um, on another okay now this is an interesting factor because i said in other videos and this this always shocks people um as far as the data that we have indicate there are when it comes to child sexual offenses more child sexual offenses are carried out by non-paedophiles than by paedophiles okay there and we know for a fact that there there is a large body of people who have a sexual attraction to children that they never asked for uh never wanted um or struggle with and are committed and dedicated to, to never um, having any kind of sexual or romantic uh, interaction with a child and go to great pains to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. And there are lots of people that abuse children who uh, don't have a, a, a sexual interest in, in children. They have an interest in sadism and they will use uh, sadistic tendencies as a means to humiliate and harm the, the child. And there are lots of other uh, reasons and categories of people that, that abuse children in a sexual way who aren't paedophilic, okay? Um, now, uh, that might shock people, but keep your mind open, you know, keep your mind open. Just because that's different to what you might have thought uh, doesn't mean that you should reject or respond to that in a hostile way, because that's what the data says. And I've uh, worked in a forensic psychotherapy setting with uh, a lot of people who have done what we call sexual harm. And uh, actually, very few of them um, that I've worked with actually have a, a paedophilic orientation. OK, so it's a bit mind blowing. Uh, it's a bit world shaking, that piece of information, but but it's true. But I'm, I'm just mentioning that that's a tangent. This channel is is uh, famous and beloved for its uh, tangents. And there will be more, I'm sure. Sometimes there are tangents of tangents. And sometimes I get lost on a tangent and never come back to the main point. Sometimes I leave a tangent hanging. Um, you just have to bear with me, really. This is the kind of channel we are. If you don't like this style, um, just go. Um, go as a friend and find, find a, a, another channel that's, uh, you know, well presented and concise. Um, but this, this channel and my style is more like, more like a fireside chat. You know, we're friends having a having a chat over the fire. Over the fire? By the fire. Uh, so, okay, where was I? Where did I start on that? For sadism and sadists. Okay, so sexual sadists get turned on. And non-sexual sadists, uh, they, they just have that desire. Uh, they just have this, this tendency of wanting to inflict pain, harm and, and humiliation and or um, delete as appropriate. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so Nick in the, the video says that he, he thinks that everybody is slightly sadist. It's like a spectrum that everybody's on. Some people are highly sadist, sadistic. Some people are not very sadistic at all. Um, I almost agree with that. I almost agree with that. What I would say, I would just be a bit more um, precise maybe and say that we all have the potential for sadism because we are, as a species, we are predators and uh you know um in our ancestors and probably somewhere in our genes even if those genes aren't activated uh there is the um potential and the propensity to uh kill an animal and eat an animal uh or to kill to uh protect uh oneself or one's loved ones um now i wouldn't necessarily generally describe that as sadism but i, I suspect that where people are sadistic it's because uh, I'm a big, big fan of evolutionary psychology, that it's probably a throwback to um, to that uh, to our primeval past, where having that killer instinct, maybe having more of a killer instinct than than one's peers, made you more likely to pass on your genes. Okay, so I think that's a, that's um, what what I would say about that. Um, but I wouldn't say most people are sadistic, and I wouldn't say most crimes are sadistic. I think most crimes are. Crime is very interesting, and it's, it's often it's not what you think. Um, so, and he would say that you know people like Chris Watts are sadistic, um, and Rex Huberman. Now, if there was a scale of uh, sadism, I would say that uh, Rex Huberman, Huberman is. I never know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Is higher up the scale than Chris Watts, but I don't think. Uh, sadism is is at the the bottom of any of, of either of those things really. I think um, 
Chris, uh, so it's about dominance, essentially. Most, so, well, let me, let me be more specific here. I think um, most serial killers, um, the predominating factor is psychopathy. And psychopathy isn't what people think it is. I've done other, other videos on that, so check out my other videos on psychopathy. Um, the dominant, the dominating factor is is the desire to dominate, <laughs> coupled with psychotherapy. And sorry about the image there; that's not very nice, is it? But it's relevant to to the video because um, he's talking about anality and he does talk about feces and things like that. We'll get on to that in a moment. So Rex Herman, let's say, is a uh, is is. I mean, if you've ever watched that video of Rex Herman where he's just been interviewed about his architecture practice, he totally tries to dominate the interviewer and dominate the situation. So it's all about kind of dominance. And with psychopathy, uh, basically, there, there's nothing to rein you in. Um, you haven't got that. Uh, you haven't got the moral compass. You haven't got empathy for other people. And all the wildest fantasies that you might have that somebody else might might have but dismiss immediately or if they do have them they would never act on them there's nothing to stop them acting on it there's no internal restraint if you like there's external restraints often hopefully there are but there's no internal restraint so rex herman and most serial killers psychopathy is the main factor uh there's other factors as well so most serial killers have been abused in childhood and head injury is uh is hardly ever talked about with crime but it should be uh, head injuries is, is often, I believe, a, a common factor as as well. I'm not sure the latest research is is on that. So Rex Herman, that's what's going on there. Uh, and there are serial killers that are that are what we would call sadistic serial killers or sadistic psychopaths, and they will go out of their way to inflict pain and suffering. So now I can't remember. Did Rex Herman? Did he kidnap his victims and keep them alive? See, this is where I'm. I'm, um, I'm not. I have um, followed the case quite a lot, but my memory is diabolical. So serial killers who are both sadistic and psychopathic, so it's usually a combination, they are the ones who will go out of their way to inflict pain and suffering and misery and humiliation. So it's not just dominance, um, it's something else as well. And uh, they're the kind of serial killers that kidnap people and torture them. Okay, so there are some serial killers that they're very quick. You know, it's all about the kill. Uh, they'll kill people as quickly as they possibly can, and then they'll make their exit. And there are some serial killers who will uh, like to torment the victims. And some serial killers will do things like phone the victim's family afterwards. Um, you know, that is you know, that's that's ex that's extremely cruel and, and sadistic. So I'm talking about sadism more from the psychological point of view really um as as distinct from cruelty i mean i guess every every serial killer is cruel um and it's you know if you define if you define sadism and cruelty in the same way which isn't correct um and i think this is what nick's doing i think he's using the word sadism in a, a more general sense um so let's go on to Chris Watts. So Chris Watts, uh, very few signs of sadism in Chris Watts, both uh, before the murders and after the murders. Uh, he, as far as we're aware, he made the murders were callous, definitely callous, but there's no evidence to me that suggests that he went out of his way to inflict pain and suffering. He just had his, had his reasons, um, his terrible reasons, uh, which can never be justified, and acted on them. And as you see in my other video, I don't even think he's a psychopath. Okay, um, and that doesn't mean, as some people seem to think. Some people seem to think that because I said he wasn't a psychopath, I meant that oh, he's a nice bloke, he's okay. <laughs> I don't think that for one minute. I think he's a terrible guy, um, and he deserves to be where he is. Um, but uh, I don't see signs of psychopathy. Or if there are, uh, I think probably. <laughs> Uh, he might be on the psychopathic scale, and there is a psychopathic scale, if you like, because there's, um, there's a psychopathic inventory. Uh, but I think it's Robert Hare, isn't it? Is that first name, Robert? Uh, and you can score different levels, different ranges. Um, but I don't think he's a clinical psychopath. So I think this young boy here, I think that is the school shooter. Uh, shooting, out shooting, hunting, basically. I'm going to say shooting animals, but we call it hunting, don't we? So... 
Nick, I don't, I don't think it's right that, that nearly all crime is driven by sadism. I think you, but you also talk about the desire to dominate, and I think that is a big factor in a lot of crime, particularly a lot of uh, a lot of murder and serial killing. Okay, and then uh, Nick went on to talk about anality. Um, I'm not sure if you used the word. I'm not sure whether you made it anality or analism or just use the word anal. I can't remember. It'll come up on the screen in a little bit. Um, which was interesting because uh, when people are using the term anal, they're usually talking about the Freudian concept of anal fixation. Okay, and I think he's using this in a very different way, which is confusing. And I'm not sure how helpful his model is around this, because what he seems to be talking about is more um, a focus on death and destruction, which he terms as anal because of feces being the waste product, the dead, the dead product that that, um, that is left, you know, we, we, that begins with nice nutritious food or begins with plants and nice nutritious food um, and then becomes, uh, you know, something that's dead and wasteful and potentially harmful. Uh, so, so in the Freudian sense, so Freud looked a lot at child development and uh, the different stages that children go through and their focus and their fixation in these different stages. There's the, the oral stage, um, there's the genital stage, there's the uh, latency is one of the stages. So the anal stage is kind of to do with kind of potty training. And it's, in the Freudian sense, it's generally about withholding. Okay, so uh, mummy and daddy want me to give them a poo. Um, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so it's a kind of an early uh, way that the, the infant can have some control. It knows what the parents want and it can hold on to them. Now, I'm not saying this theory is correct. You know, I think it's been refined a lot since then. I think out of all Freud's stuff, I think I could be wrong. I'm not, again, I'm not sure what the latest research is. I think the developmental stages... Um, are probably they're certainly less popular in psychology than they were i don't think they're very often used and i think out of all freud's work which was wide and diverse and amazing um that's probably one of the least um the least important things or maybe the least accurate things but i'm not gonna go out on a limb on that um because i've not looked at the the most recent research on that so so if somebody's anal so this is where we use terms like anally retentive which is kind of a, like a polite way of saying full of shit um so uh if somebody um so people as adults what so what freud would say is if you if somehow your your movement if let's use the pun <laughs> your movement or your movements through uh through that particular phase of development which happens at a certain age generally speaking, is problematic, then you will be somehow on some level stuck in that developmental stage. So where you maybe gain power by holding off, by not producing the, the turd that your mother and father seem to be so keen that you gave them, then you... So now he's, sorry, now he's talking about um, Scott Peterson. Um, it's another case again, very different. Um, but going back to uh, uh, pooey things, um, <laughs> if you if that was if that was your main means of gaining some control and some sense of autonomy and some re some early rebellion against your parents was by not not producing a poo on on demand, then you might do something similar in adult life. Now that doesn't mean that uh, it would have anything to do with your bowels as an adult, but what it would mean is that um, you you know what people want and you don't give it to them as a means of control. Uh, so you keep people dangling um, with maybe, you know, false promises and that kind of thing. So that's that's what um, uh, anal means. So it's withholding. So somebody that's, that's um, so somebody that's anally, uh, anally fixated you and you want to borrow a book. Maybe they've mentioned a book that you want to borrow. Um, this is the first example that comes off the top of my head. And I say, oh, yeah, 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 I'll lend you that book. But they but they never do. And you remind them and you remind them, but they don't lend you that. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody that, that forgets to lend you a book is uh, anally fixated. But that's just a, an example, really. Not maybe a fantastic example, but comes up out of the top of my head. Um, so uh, Nick from uh, True Crime Rocket Science uh, purports that uh, it's a fixation with the unhealthy. 
uh, and a fixation with death rather than life. Um, which is interesting, okay? Um, and I'm not going to dismiss that as a theory. Um, it's not one that I particularly subscribe to um, as as a, uh, a causative factor in these kinds of crimes. See, look, we are all sadists. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, that was me being Monty Python. Um, so... Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of that as a theory. Um, so I suppose my disagreement isn't so much with his theory uh, as with uh, his use of the word anal. And it's fine for him to use the word anal in a different sense to the Freudian one, but I think that could be a bit confusing. Okay, so that's that's all I would say there, really. Um, and I don't think... It's theory about, you know, being fixated on the negative... Um, I don't have a particular problem with that, but I don't I don't see that in these people, in these crimes and in these people. Not as a, a dominating causative factor. Maybe it's in the mix somewhere. Um, so what is the opposite of inality? So he, so he goes into... Now, apparently Nick's written a book on, on this or a book that covers this. So maybe I need to read the book. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I'm not understanding some of these theories correctly. So, on to uh, school shootings, okay, and you're not going to like this bit, especially if you're American, you're not going to like this next bit. Um, much as I love you American people, um, <laughs> be warned, <laughs> you're not going to like what I'm about to say. I think, some of what I'm about to say, I think uh, school shootings are mainly uh, systemic uh, they are the product of a situation rather than the product of the rather than predominantly caused by the person that does the the shooting and obviously the person that does the shooting causes the school shooting i 'm not saying that they don 't but they um, they are a link in a longer chain okay and I hate to see uh, children labeled blamed persecuted because children are children their brains are not fully developed. Um, they are, should not ever be fully accountable for their, for their actions. Okay. They should always be, um, you know, they, they should be disciplined and children should be, uh, made accountable for what they do. So we got to the end there. Look, my video is talking about the videos longer than the video, but my videos are usually long. I get criticized for that, but that's the nature of this channel. If you don't like long videos, find another channel. Uh, we'll go back to the beginning and just get the pretty pictures again. So I think the Secret Service or the Feds or whoever it is that say that there's no profile of a school shooter. And I'm talking about child school shooters, not adults that go in and, and shoot up schools. Um, I think there's similarities and there are differences in that. But children who are school shooters. Now, he talks a lot about bullying. Um, and I think he's absolutely right to talk about bullying. And bullying is a huge factor in this, a massive factor. And um, that seems to be usually the case when there's a child school shooter. Okay. So that's part of the systemic problem is the, the bullying and the fact that children often feel very powerless and the fact that children's brains aren't developed so they, they can't think in the same way as an adult about the consequences of things. Their, their gap between reality and fantasy is much, much thinner. I mean, some people remain like that as adults. Um, but do you remember the, the horrible story of the two girls who believed in Slender Man and they, uh, they horribly stabbed and nearly killed, luckily she survived, one of their friends because they thought, um, it wasn't exactly Slender Man and told me to do it, but it was, um, uh, because they felt that something, something, some kind of complex, uh, rationalization and construction in their heads that involves slender man uh, wanting a sacrifice or something like that and they tried to kill their their friend and I think particularly the American criminal justice system is so harsh on children with the sentences that they give them children's brains haven't fully formed yet people don't don't aren't born with a fully formed brain okay so as we grow up and we mature and we learn more about appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. It's not just due to learning and life experience. It's due to the fact that our brain is still developing. Sometimes up until about 25, our brain is still forming. So to actually you know, give these children like life sentences or something close to a life sentence appalls me. So 
So children's brains aren't fully developed and their grasp on consequences isn't uh, fully, fully developed, you know, as in seeing things through and the decision making isn't, you know, isn't very developed. All these things. Okay. So there are children that are being bullied all over the world that will fantasize about uh, taking revenge and shooting the shooting the bullies or killing the bullies in some way but in most cases they don't have the means okay because of access to uh, lethal weapons in America the access to lethal lethal weapons is probably I don't know if it's the the most easy access of any country in the world um, but it's probably up there isn't it um, you know, people owning weapons. So, like, in, I was born in the UK, and I, I now live in New Zealand. Both countries have kind of quite similar gun laws. I think probably more people have uh, firearms in New Zealand because it's a bigger hunting scene. People hunt things like pigs and goats, which sort of seems really bizarre to me. But uh, there we go. <laughs> in the UK, people hunt rabbits and deer. Um, so, farmers in the UK generally they'll they'll have a shotgun um, for shooting pests. Um, and there'll be people that that hunt um not so much as in new zealand there's not so many wilderness areas in the in the uh or, or forested areas in the uk that are uh that aren't national parks that you can hunt in um so more firearms here than in the uk but generally speaking people don't have firearms so if you you know if you're in a suburban environment nobody's gonna have a weapon no, certainly no, people don't have pistols and certainly people if they do have a firearm it's got to be locked away it's got to be uh, kept in a metal cabinet uh, the ammunition has got to be kept somewhere separate so uh, you know occasionally uh, or you know the, the criminal underworld will have access to to weapons but not a huge amount you know not a huge amount we don't get a huge amount of shootings in the uk or new zealand new zealand they're, they're in the news a lot actually shootings because there's a gang culture in new zealand that's why that's why there's um shootings um new zealand um has got probably uh, almost as many gangs as, as america has so uh in america the access to firearms is sort of very easy um, and it's not hard for children to, uh, you know, if they're a little bit crafty, to get hold of their mum or dad's firearm and take it into school. Um, now, <clears throat> so I think, you know, a big factor in this, a big factor in this is bullying, a big factor in this is uh, the, the, the child, um, the child's mental and cognitive inability to, to make good decisions and distinguish between, you know, what you fantasize about and what you actually do. And the easy availability of firearms is is another factor. Now, uh, if you're American, you're probably pulling your hair out now and spitting feathers, as my mum would say, um, because Americans are very touchy about this, aren't they? You're very touchy, you Americans, about your, your firearms, you know, because it's all it's. It's tied into something bigger for a lot of people in America. It's tied into kind of almost like a, a civil right. Um, but to people outside America, we find that very hard to understand. You're kind of very locked into this view. And people from outside America, we just we just don't get it. And I kind of can because, um, you know, my job is, is about being empathic and getting inside people's heads. So I can usually see inside the head of somebody, even if I disagree with them, I can kind of see why they feel the way they feel. Um, but um and well i could say i could say lots more about the firearms in, in america but um the i don't think people many people in america let's put this carefully many people in america are unable to think rationally about the firearms issue because it's associated with so many bigger things for them that they that have a high um that are emotive Okay, that have a high emotional um, charge, um, that it's very difficult for people to think critically. Okay, now I've been very polite with that, um, but you still could be tearing your hair out and spitting feathers if you're American. But um, if you are, um, tell me your point of view. Tell me it from your, but don't don't just be abusive and don't just quote um, you know tropes and memes. You know, give me give me critical thinking. Give me give me enlighten me. Tell me if I'm tell me if I'm wrong. But certainly the school shootings don't happen to the same degree as the in a in America as in, a, in Europe and elsewhere as they do in America. Um, and sometimes people will use a knife 
because knives are always easy to get hold of. Uh, so it's not the only factor, but it, it definitely is a factor. And then the third, well, the third factor, because I've probably listed more than three, I've lost count. But and, uh, the final factor, I guess, on I want to say on school shootings is often they are um, basically aggravated suicides. Um, not in every case, but often there's somebody that, that, you know, bullying and suicide are highly connected. You know, so somebody's... Um, you know, somebody's pent up with frustration and powerlessness or a sense of powerlessness and anger and resentment. Uh, and also, you know, they're suffering so much that they feel they can't continue to live. And this should never be allowed to happen by the authorities. Never, never, never. Um, and, they're, and they decide they're going to end it all, but they are going to take people out with them, which is often the case with family annihilation. So Chris Watts was, a, was an exception to the rule with family annihilation. He wanted to get his family out of the way because they were uh, preventing him from... Um, they were, he, he considered them a nuisance, really. They were, they were, um, their, their very presence uh, was getting in the way of his goals. <clears throat> But um, so often, you know, rather than think of it as a murder, and I've heard people talk about Pat, Pat Brown, who I love, Pat Brown, criminal profiler, who's a great channel. Uh, go and visit that channel. Um, I love Pat. She's got a similar style to mine. She's, you know, I was talking about one um, child um, school shooter and um, implying that he was a psychopath and things like that. And generally speaking, I don't think they are. I don't think they are. It's possible. I mean, well, technically it's not possible because you can't be a psychopath as a child. You can only be di only be given the, the diagnosis, uh, although it's not strictly a diagnosis. It's kind of a, a category of a diagnosis when you're an adult. But you can kind of have a proto-psychopath, I guess. But I think, you know, I don't think it's... Um, a prerequisite for uh, these child tutors to be psychopathic. Um, but it's possible they might have some pre-psychopathic traits in some cases. I'm not saying never. Um, but again, psycho psychopathy is not the driving factor in school shooting. So the school, the, the factor is accessibility to firearms, um, the terrible uh, effects of bullying, um, which is an awful, awful thing. Uh, I can't say that enough. And... Uh, the fact that in some cases it's an aggravated suicide. So that's what I would say about uh, school shooters. I, and I think that's that's why you you won't get a kind of a profile, other than maybe the profile that's consistent with somebody that's bullied, um, if there is one. So thank you for listening to that. I hope you found that interesting. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but um, true crime... Uh, true crimers and YouTubers are both notor both sets of people that are notoriously bad at disagreeing politely and having a, a, a good debate that's respectful and intelligent. And when you cross those two things over, people that are into true crime and YouTube, <laughs> it's an even higher concentration of uh, people that uh, think that the way to argue is to insult the person that's uh, that's made the argument that you don't like, uh, which is not productive. Uh, so if you do that, I will destroy you verbally, and uh, or, or yes, verbally, uh, and then um, I just hesitated there because I was thinking, what well, is written? Is that still verbal? But it is verbal. Um, not that I was thinking for a moment that I would destroy you physically because I won't do that. I'm not. I'm not a killer. Um, or a psychopath. Um, and then I'll uh, delete your comments. So, so don't do that. Um, so yeah, comments please. And thank you for watching this video. If you've watched this video up till now uh, and not got too cross or, too, or, or take an objection to my style, uh, well done. <laughs> uh, and by watching it all the way through to the very end, you, you help promote our videos in the algorithm and that helps us help people with retroactive jealousy. So I'm grateful to you for that. So uh, thank you very much and we'll catch you in the next one. Rangi Marie.